to this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm podcast. In this episode, we highlight three pieces of evidence which reveal that Sheila Caffell was alive and active within White House Farm from the first arrival of the police at the scene until after the raid team entered the house. This evidence is just one of Jeremy Bamber's many alibis. Yet Essex police have sought to obscure or manipulate the facts in several ways, including altering documents and hiding the original statements written by officers who attended the scene. Had it not been for the disclosure Jeremy's team had in 2011, this evidence would never have been uncovered. Evidence has been extracted from the disclosed case documents, which reveals that not only was their movement from within the main bedroom seen through the window, but also that a gun appeared and disappeared from a window whilst the house was under observation by trained firearms officers. Lights within the house were being switched on and off at various times throughout the morning whilst police were outside, and curtains in the main bedroom were opened and closed. Based on the judge's direction, it was either Jeremy Bamber or Sheila Caffell who killed the family, as he set out in his summing up of the trial evidence to members of the jury as follows. On the facts of this case, the killer was either Sheila or Jeremy Bamber, and therefore it follows that if you are sure that Sheila did not carry out the killings, it also follows that you must be sure that the defendant did so. And equally, if you're not sure that Sheila did or did not carry out the killings, if you are either sure that she did or are uncertain whether she did or not, then it follows that you have not been made sure that the defendant did so, and therefore he would be not guilty. So either way, that second issue I suggest to you, are you sure that Sheila did not carry out the killings, will lead you to a verdict in this case. For Jeremy to have a single alibi should cast doubt upon this conviction. But to have numerous alibis, all of which are supported by documented evidence which is contained in the case material, should leave no doubts at all that he is completely innocent. The first issue we'll discuss is the one you'll be aware of if you've followed Jeremy's case in the media or read books and watched television programmes about the tragedy. This is the movement seen in the master bedroom window by two police officers and Jeremy. During his telephone call with PC West at 3.36am, Jeremy was requested to meet officers at the scene. Jeremy drove his car to his parents' home and was overtaken by police car numbered CA-07 containing Police Constable Robin Saxby, Police Constable Stephen Mile and Police Sergeant Christopher Buse from Whitton Police Station. Jeremy arrived at the entrance to Pages Lane, which leads to White House Farm, a couple of minutes after the police at approximately 3.50am. After a few minutes' discussion at the entrance to the lane, the police car, followed by Jeremy and his silver Astra, slowly proceeded to drive down the lane and parked just beyond the farm cottages, approximately 200 yards or 600 feet from the farmhouse. It was at this stage that Buse thought they should do a reconnaissance of the house in order to see if they could establish what the situation was. He decided that the driver, PC Saxby, should remain with the radio car, whilst he, PC Mile and Jeremy would make a recce of the main house. This is recorded as happening at 3.55am on the log which was started by PC Saxby. On this initial recce, as the three approached the front of the house from what was considered to be a safe distance, all three saw movement in the main bedroom window. Jeremy told us that all three saw a figure walk from right to left and that they immediately hid behind a hedge before running back to the police car. P.C. Saxby recorded in his September 1985 witness statement that, about five minutes later, all three came running back from the direction of the farmhouse and Buse contacted information room and requested armed assistance and gave a situation report. This situation report, made by Buse, has never been disclosed to the defence. It is believed that this report has to contain information about the movement which had been seen. This movement must have had an impact on Buse and the others because it was at this stage that Buse requested the assistance of firearms officers to attend the scene. 
The request for firearms units to attend is timed in police documents as being made at 4.11 a.m. The incident log, written by PC West, states 0411 via IR10 CA7 Request made via Information Room 10 from car CA-7 Request for Firearms Team Although Buse remained silent about the fact that he had made a situation report in any of his pre-trial or trial evidence, he later told DCI Dickinson in a post-trial internal inquiry during 1986 that We return to CA-7 and I decide to call out Firearms Unit on OBO Observations Colchester brief situation report given to VG. Neither Bewes, Mile or Saxby gave any evidence in their pre-trial statements about this incident. This seems particularly strange as the movement which two of the officers had observed led to the actions of Bewes after the sighting and ultimately resulted in 29 firearms officers and their commanders attending the scene. This involved some officers having to abandon the duties they were undertaking at the time, whilst others were woken from their sleep and instructed to collect arms to attend a siege situation at White House Farm. This happened a second time after, later in the morning, following a conversation with someone from within the house, which we will discuss in detail in a different alibi special. During the trial and the cross-examination of views, Jeremy passed his QC and notes to question Buse about the movement they had seen in the bedroom window. Geoffrey Rivlin QC then directed a question to Buse about the movement. But oddly, Mr Rivlin appeared to assist Buse in his response to this question by providing a reason for the movement seen in the window as he asked. Question. Do you remember at some stage early on this happened that one of your police officers said that you thought you could see a shadow and you all jumped? Answer. Yeah. That is, when we first went to the house with Mr. Bamber. We had gone round to what I thought was the back. We had seen the kitchen door with the light on. We then went into a field which is at the side of the farmhouse and went round to where what is, I believe, the front door is, and above that is a window. As we moved away... I thought we saw something else move, a shadow, something like that. We looked up and, after looking for a couple of minutes, I was satisfied that it was a, well, perhaps a part in the glass that just shone the light slightly as you looked at it. Question. It could have been a trick of the light? Answer. I think it was a trick of the light. It is unknown why Mr Rivlin, a defence QC, would lead the witness to answer in this way and make suggestions as to the answer he should give. Buse also stated in his evidence at trial that As we moved away, I thought we saw something else move, a shadow, something like that. In this part of his evidence, Buse states, something else move. This phrase is not only a clear reference to the fact that he had witness movement within the house, but that movement had possibly been observed by Buse on more than one occasion, or what could be the reason for stating that they saw something else move. Mr Rivlin failed to ask any more questions about this issue, or ask B.C. Mile about it when he gave his evidence at the trial. Likewise, Jeremy was not asked, and was not permitted to volunteer this information unless asked. Considering that at trial, Buse agreed that the movement was a shadow or trick of the light. It seems very peculiar that Buse, PC Mile and Jeremy's initial reaction had been to all duck down and hide behind a hedge before running back to the waiting police car and requesting armed assistance. This seems a very extreme reaction to a shadow or trick of the light. Would senior police officers who had to authorise the deployment of the very expensive and highly skilled marksmen and women to the scene do so because of a trick of the light? Would armed officers surround the house and aim their loaded weapons at the windows because an officer thought he saw a shadow? The specialist teams would only be called to attend if it was deemed that there was 
imminent threat to life and an ongoing siege situation, which is how it was described on the police logs. Since 1985 to the present day, Buys has continually changed his evidence regarding this issue. Fresh evidence emerged on this subject in 2010, as Buys gave an interview to Mark Williams Thomas for the Tonight television programme. Buys discussed the movement seen in the main bedroom window in his interview and said, When we were doing the perimeter check, Jeremy said, Hang on, is that movement? And I looked, and I moved my head, and yeah, we thought we could see movement. In 2011, Buys gave another televised interview in which he mentions the same movement, although this time he states it was PC Mile who drew their attention to it. As we go round, Steve Mile says, Oh, hang on, stop, I think I saw someone move. And we look up, and I said, Where? And he said, That window up there. And he's indicating, as we're looking at the back of the building, top right. So, first floor on the right-hand side. This statement was broadcast on national television, and confirms that this was the figure of a person that was seen by the use of the words someone. Buse is certainly not a reliable witness, as his versions of events regarding the movement he witnessed in the window changes each time he's asked. It's also important to realise that the so-called trick of the light was an absolute impossibility. So why do we say this? The answer is because of the evidence given by Buse and PC Mile, which is recorded on the logs, is that when they did the recce of the house, they reported that all lights on in the premises. Therefore, the light was on in the main bedroom at the time, meaning that what they saw can only have been from behind the window in the room. The light in the main bedroom also had no shade on it, which meant that the light wasn't dimmed at all, and the photographs taken from outside the house show that the light was switched on. The police who were in the house all deny using light switches, and therefore this was how Sheila ultimately left the light in that room. So, to summarise this aspect, because a bright, unshaded light was on within the room, it would have been impossible to see a reflection in the glass of the window of something from outside. Yet even more evidence has come to light that not only has the situation report views made via the police radio for the firearms assistance never been disclosed, but also witness statements made by Buse and PC Mile have been hidden from the defence. The evidence of this is contained in the interview notes completed during Buse's interview with DCI Dickinson on the 7th of November 1986. In this post-trial evidence, Buse admitted for the very first time that PC Mile and I made handwritten statements that night and we addressed them to DS Jones, left them either in CID tray or in DS Jones' office. Buse is talking about the night of the 7th of August 1985, but yet again, as is a common thread time and time again in Jeremy's case, no statements have ever been disclosed to the defence that were written by Buse and PC Mile on the 7th of August 1985, either handwritten, as Buse stated they were, or later typed versions. What happened to these statements which were placed in DS Jones' office or in his CID tray? Why have they never been disclosed? Do they contain a detailed account of the movement of the person seen in the main bedroom shortly after 4am, was this part of the evidence used by DCI Keneally when he conducted a review of the case on the 6th of September 1986, in which he concluded, the evidence indicates Sheila was responsible. As yet, we don't know, because Essex Police have not disclosed the report made by DCI Keneally or the evidence he stated he relied upon to reach his conclusion. We now move on to additional issues which prove Sheila Caffell was alive and active in the house whilst the police and Jeremy were outside. And this focuses on the evidence from several police officers and firearms officers who attended the scene and had the house under surveillance. 
There are numerous conflicting references in police testimony regarding the changing situation with the lights and curtains in White House Farm. Many of the police officers' witness statements referred to this fluctuating situation with the lights and the curtains, but it has only been by detailed cross-referencing, taking into account when each officer was watching particular windows, that this evidence has been uncovered. According to entries made on two of the wireless message logs, which were written as events unfolded throughout the morning, at 4.09am it was reported that information was given by one of the first officers to arrive, Buse, Saxby or Mile, that all lights on premises. By the time the first firearms teams arrived and started their observations from 5am, the status of the lights had changed significantly. As each team of firearms officers arrived at the scene, they took up various observation positions around the house. In the limited statements which have been disclosed, the officers recorded their positions and changes of position. They also recorded which windows they were monitoring and the state of the curtains and the lights in each of the rooms they were covering. Firearms officer PC Alexander Smart arrived at the scene at 4.59am in transit van QK-26 and took position on the white green corner of the house. In his witness statement, PC Alexander Smart recorded that from his observation post that some of the lights which were previously stated to have been switched on in the radio report that said all lights on in premises were now switched off. PC Alexander Smart recorded the light was on in the kitchen, in the two rooms above the kitchen, and the only other light that was turned on was above the front door. His statement said, From my position, I could see a door which was closed, to its right a window which appeared to be the kitchen window, the lights of which were turned on, there were no curtains in the window. One room had pink curtains drawn closed, the other with blue curtains drawn closed. Lights were on behind both sets of curtains. The only other light on was above the door. All windows appeared to be shut. Firearms officer PC Kenneth Delgado had arrived in the same van as PC Alexander Smart and he was positioned next to his colleague observing the same windows. PC Delgado recorded the same information about the lights in his witness statement. PC Lawrence Collins gave evidence in a statement that when he was watching the house at approximately 5.10am that We looked around the farmhouse and saw that on the kitchen side of the house the following lights were switched on. Kitchen with no curtains at window and two upstairs rooms directly above the kitchen. One room had pink curtains drawn closed and one room with blue curtains drawn closed. There was only one other light switched on in the house, which was situated directly over the main door. Firearms officers PC Christopher McIntosh and PC Gary Matthews were observing the front of the house shortly after 5am following their arrival in transit van QK-50. They both gave evidence in statements that they could only see a small amount of light in the master bedroom, which, they decided, was because of a light being lit in a different room, meaning that the master bedroom light was not switched on. Both PC McIntosh and PC Matthews made identical statements regarding their observations that included information that the main bedroom curtains were open. From this position, we had a clear view of the red side. I could see an upper light on in the centre of the red upper storey. The top sash window, red white corner, was slightly ajar at the top. The upper window, red black side, had the curtains drawn. There was a light source in the upper red white side window, possibly coming from the light in the centre upper red side. Acting Police Sergeant Timothy Mildenhall was a firearms officer who arrived at the scene at 7am. According to his witness statement, when he was conducting his observations of the house shortly after he arrived, the light in the master bedroom was now switched on. In his statement, he wrote, 
our position was located some 30 to 40 yards from the actual house which afforded a clear view of the red side, which I would describe as follows. The ground floor had a large white door positioned centrally with a large window to either side of the door. These appeared to be of the sash cord type, as did all the windows. On the first floor, going from left to right, was another window. This was slightly open at the top, and the light in the room was on. The next window was directly above the door, and the next to the right of that. The curtains in the last room appeared to be drawn. This was the exact opposite of what was seen by PC Matthews and PC Macintosh two hours earlier, when the light in the main bedroom had been switched off. PC Alan Brown was deployed with PS Mildenhall to go to the red, white side of the house for containment purposes. In his witness statement, he described that From this position, and at that time, I could see that the upstairs window in my concern was slightly open at the top and that the curtains were closed. Therefore, not only were the lights going on and off, but the main bedroom curtains had been open and then closed and then open again. They must have been open when Buse, PC Mile and Jeremy conducted the initial recce of the house shortly after arriving, as how else would movement have been seen in the main bedroom? Crime scene photographs do not show the curtains as being of a transparent material. The curtains then appear to have remained open until just after 7am, when PC Brown and PS Mildenhall observed that they were closed as they conducted surveillance. The crime scene photographs show the main bedroom curtains were open and that the light in the room was on when the first photographs were taken. Essex police vehemently deny that they touched anything in the house apart from a stool. So this begs the obvious question, who was turning the lights on and off? And who closed and opened the main bedroom curtains? This is evidence which further proves life existed in the house when Jeremy was outside in the company of multiple police officers. Why was this material not disclosed pre-trial? Why have Essex police hidden evidence which could have benefited the defence? And what is the reason that Essex police still refuse to disclose the material which we've discussed in this episode? Essex police may have felt confident at the time that these issues would never see the light of day, as they were hidden under the blanket of public interest immunity. But changes in the PII rules, which Essex Police could not have anticipated, have enabled us to uncover the truth about their deliberate acts to pervert the course of justice. In the second episode of this Alibi mini-series, we'll focus on two further documented events and provide the facts about the police being in conversation with someone from within the house at around 5.25 a.m. and a 999 emergency call being made from inside White House Farm at 6.09 a.m. whilst the police and Jeremy Bamber were still outside the house. Mm -hmm.